Let's turn in our Bibles for the scripture reading this morning to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And I will start reading with verse 22, and then we'll read the verse together after that alternately. As our custom is, let's go ahead and stand for the reading of the Word of God. And I'll begin with verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them, and when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless the reading from our Bible that you've allowed us to have this morning. We thank you so much for letting us have the scriptures in English. We pray that you would be with our pastor while he's away. But we'd ask right now that you'd bless the message from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Ye blind be 
in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 8, the Bible says, And now for a little space grace hath been showed from the Lord our God, that our God may lighten the eyes and give us a little reviving. Here in Acts chapter 26, we have the sad ending of a tragedy concerning the life of three people. We'll talk about those three people in just a moment. But as we come up to chapter 26, the, the history is starting in chapter 24 when Paul is taken. Paul is taken from... Well, let's look back over there and go over two pages here to chapter 24. In the first verse, it says, And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain order named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. So here you have these men that uh, were religious leaders. And they were upset about what Paul said. They brought accusation against him. And, of course, in the Bible, whenever there was accusation made, they would always go to the political leaders and, and switch everything around and say that it was really a political plot against the leader at the time, when really it had nothing to do with that. It was against their religion. So here's Paul being held. We see in verse 24 of chapter 24. And after certain days, then Felix... Not Felix the cat, but Felix the uh, one in charge there came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith of Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. So here's Paul, he's preaching to the leader, of, he's under his control at this time in this area, and he gets under conviction, and his wife's a Jewess, and so she knows what's been happening in the area, and they all want to deny the situation concerning their own soul. Now that's very important for what we're going to talk about this morning, because this morning, I'm not talking to the person beside you. I'm talking to you. So Felix now, he's about ready to uh, leave, retire out, so to speak. It says here in verse 27, But after two years, uh, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So now, Felix is out, and Festus is coming in. Uh, I, I'm not any kind of an expert on uh, Rome history or anything like that, but here's the, the new governor now. He comes in, and he wants to make uh, a big splash uh, in the eyes of uh, Caesar. And so Paul is handed over to him, and now he's also in charge of this new area, and this is where we pick up the story in chapter 26. So Paul, in chapter 26 now, he has given the gospel not only to uh, Felix, but it's transferred over to Festus, and then Agrippa comes in, and he is, he is in charge of regions, kind of like region, state, nation, this kind of a thing. And so they all happened to be there at that time, just by coincidence. No, God told Paul that this would happen. And so he, there he is before the king, and he had also appealed so that he could go to Caesar Augustus himself. But he's working his way through, and God's carrying him through. Now, this is important because Paul tells him in verse 19, chapter 26, verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He tells him, Paul, he tells him I'm doing exactly what God told me to do. Of course, on the other hand, 
as he's speaking directly to the king, the, the obvious is the king is disobedient to what God told him to do. So he's not making a splash. He's not making a good impression right off the bat. But Paul is telling him what God said needed to be told. And so he goes down through here the things which we just read in this passage. And these three people, Bernus, the governor Festus, and Agrippa, to my knowledge, they've, they never received Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord. This being the case, all three are in hell today. The Bible does, however, reveal that uh, they may have different reasons for not being saved. All of these excuses still exist today, and if you're a soul winner and talk to people about Jesus Christ, you, you understand these things. Number one, we have Festus. He was the governor. He was trying to make this big impression around, uh, for those around him because now you have King Agrippa in his presence and also now just being put into position by uh, Caesar himself. When this happens, people try to build themselves up and cut other people down. So when he starts getting under conviction, what does he say? He says, ah, Paul, you're beside yourself. You're mad. Paul, you're nuts if you believe that kind of stuff. Verse 24, And as he thus spake for himself, that's Paul, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But you see, it wasn't something that Paul learned. It was what Paul knew. Paul knew of Jesus Christ. Paul had seen the risen Savior. Paul knew from an eyewitness account what had happened. So he was not just reading things from a book and then getting before these authorities and telling them what he thought. No, he was telling them the truth from what God had shown him. And he began to resist conviction. Yesterday, my wife and I, we were having this garage sale, and <laughs> uh, pray for me, please. <laughs> we, had, we had this garage sale, and we had um, two Muslim men come in from Ethiopia, and they stood and they talked with me for over an hour, and they were older gentlemen, and they were very polite to me, um, but right off the bat, I, I asked them, you know, why... They, they knew that there was only two places that you can go. He, they knew that you either went to heaven or that you went to hell. And I said, oh, wh why is it that some people go to heaven and other people go to hell? What's the difference? And I said, the difference is the people that go to hell believe the wrong thing. You either believe you have more time, you either believe it don't matter, you either believe that uh, the Pope's the way to heaven, you either believe that Allah's the way to heaven, you believe any of those kinds of things, but if you go to hell, it's because you believe the wrong thing. And so we talked a little bit more, and then I said, uh, you know, you must have a blood sacrifice to take your sin away, because you'll never be clean before God, and you'll never be able to enter into His presence unless you have a blood sacrifice. And I said, do you have one? No, we don't have one. And I said, well, you know what that means then, don't you? That means you're going to hell. Oh, don't say that. I said, well, if I didn't say it, that wouldn't change anything. And so we continued to talk, and they didn't get up. They, they didn't get uh, uh, outwardly upset, but they were under deep conviction. And so, if you can uh, pray for Hassan and Muhammad. But you see, Festus here, he resisted the conviction. We as Christians, we should not resist the Holy Ghost when he talks to us. 
You know, sometimes the, the Holy Ghost talks to us uh, when we're getting ready for church. And the Holy Ghost says, you know, you need to take about three or four minutes here and just pray before you get to church. Because you've been messing up all week, and you want the Lord to talk to you through his word, and you're not even prepared yet. I hear all the time, oh, Brother Yoder, I wish we just had a spirit-filled service. Well, our spirit-filled service is going to be as filled as the people that come in. And so here's Festus resisting specifically here for salvation. Then you have Burnus, and she was kind of like a, a modern Hollywood, day, uh, Hollywood kind of a woman, uh, like the strange woman of Proverbs chapter 7. She was married to her uncle, then she lived uh, a life of adultery and fornication and incest with her brother Agrippa, then she married the king of Sicilia as well as Titus of Vespian. And she got under a conviction also. Why, why did she get under conviction? Who, who knows? You know, maybe, maybe that, uh, she could tell from her own life, this can't be right. You know, a lot of times people do things, and they know it's wrong, but they continue to do it. And sometimes you just need a Christian to say, hold it a minute here. We're, we're not living for ourselves. We're living for God. And so when I see somebody that's uh, uh, dressed wrong or, or doing things that aren't right according to the Bible, I don't need to say anything. Why? Because if they're saved, they have the Holy Spirit. And just my presence talking to them and bringing up the truth, they get under conviction and they get upset and they get worried. She agreed with the preacher, but she wouldn't humble herself. Let's look in Acts chapter 25, verse 13. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesar to salute Festus. Verse 23. And on the morrow when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains, and principal men of the city. At Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And so here they come with their uh, great pomp, the Bible says. When you look that word up, it means uh, fantasia, fantasy, escort. It's from where the word Pompeii Island came from, which was an extremely wicked place, and God actually uh, blew it off the map from a volcano. She would rather party and live in filth uh, just like the woman that had the head of John the Baptist cut off. But after all, she was living at the time with Agrippa, Herod's grandson. I don't know if you've ever looked at uh, Roman history and who married who and, and those kinds of things. But man, it's terrible. It, it goes all over the place. People living with brothers and sisters and uh, marrying aunts and uncles and then going back and starting all over again. A terrible one. I mean, it, it, it almost sounds like America. We, we run into places all the time and uh, these churches that we go to out in, the, out in the boondocks and wherever, and they say, is what we hear about Columbus true with all that homosexual stuff and everything? We just kind of drop our heads. Yeah, it's probably worse than what you hear about. You know, we, it's, a, it's a sad situation. Then we have number three, Agrippa. Agrippa, too, was under great conviction. But unlike the others, he didn't mock and jeer at Paul, uh, and he listened with uh, seriousness. However, he, too, rejected salvation and will go down in history as one of the saddest quotes in the Bible. And we see that in chapter 26, verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You see, there are those that they don't really mean to go to hell. 
They don't, they don't want to go to hell. But they almost do what it takes to get to heaven, which is receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Him alone. Amen? And it, and it, and it doesn't change anything. So here you have a man almost saved but lost. Almost truth is a lie. Almost believing is to deny. Almost obeying is to disobey. Almost persuading is rejecting. Almost straight is crooked. Almost honest is a cheat. Almost pure is vile. Almost holy is unclean. Almost a Christian is to be a natural man. Almost forgiven is guilt. Almost justified is to be a sinful mess. And almost heaven is hell. Many preachers will say today, Agrippa is in hell right now, screaming and crying, Almost! 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 In the flames and burning hell, almost. But today, I've got some good news for you. You're not dead. And you're not in hell. If you're saved, you're not in heaven yet. Now, some of you, you might look like it. And those of you that smoke might smell like it. But you're not dead yet. So apparently, you have at least one more chance. Let me give you some areas where you have one more chance. First of all, in the area of salvation. Are you, are you sure you're saved? I mean, are you 100% sure if you died today that you'd go to heaven? You see, uh, death is sure. The rapture is sure, amen? We're supposed to be praying about that, that he would return, amen? We know he's coming back, so we must be prepared for death. And the way to do that is through salvation in Jesus Christ. Are you sure you're saved? If, if, there, if things are not clear in your mind, I mean, if it's hazy whether you are or whether you aren't, the Bible tells us in the book of Peter that we are to make that sure. Don't guess whether or not you're going to make it or whether you're going to end up in hell. The, the, the risks are too great. Why? Because it's your eternity that's at stake. You must be sure. The Bible says in Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Do you know for sure that you are saved right now? Do, do you remember any details at all? Now, I'm not saying you have to know everything, okay? I was a, I was a little boy, and I was saved. Thank the Lord. I, I've been saved for a long time. I was saved when I was four and a half years old. And I, I know I don't look over 30 right now, but I'm a little bit older than that. And what happened was is I went to my dad, and I went into his bedroom, and I asked him, uh, if he would show me how to be saved. And I, I kneeled beside his bed, and um, I prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart and save me after my dad explained it to me. And then he, he looked at me, and he said, Now, Dave, who saved you? And I said, Dad, you did. <laughs> and, and he said, no, no. And so he started going through the whole thing again. And, he said, and I said, Dad, I, I just misunderstood the question. I know Jesus saved me, but you told me about it. Now, my mom says that that was uh, first thing in the morning. And that Dad was getting ready for work. And, and when um, I went and told Dad I wanted to be saved, she said he dropped his razor in the sink and came into the bedroom and led me to Christ. I don't remember any of that. I thought it was at night. You know why? Because the only thing I remember is after I got saved, I went to bed. 
And, and I remember that. But that's all I need to know. But I remember those things. Now, you can't have somebody living inside you and not know it. I don't remember what day of the week it was. I, I know what date it was on the calendar. January 14th, 1970. Praise the Lord for that. But I'm asking you, do you remember anything at all about when you asked Jesus Christ to be... Hey, I remember when I got baptized, okay? You remember that. That might be a landmark for you. But why did you get baptized? What did that have to do with anything? If that is the focal point of your salvation, you missed it, sir. Do you know who talked to you? Do you know what brought it on that caused the conviction? No conviction, no conversion. It's not just, I'm going to pray a prayer. There's a lot of people when they wake up in the morning, they say, thank God I'm not in the hospital. Thank you for giving me another day of life. And they go on their life in their, in their business. But that's not salvation. Salvation is when you realize you're lost. You're a sinner. And you can't get away with sin in front of a holy God. There's a judgment on sin. And you'll receive that judgment in hell and pay for that forever unless you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin and you put your faith and trust on him and what he did on Calvary paid for the judgment of your sin if you're willing to accept that and ask him to personally be your savior and the verse I just said here about the blood of Jesus Christ it cleanses us from all sin and I'm just as clean right now in God's eyes as I was back in 1970. Because the blood never loses its power. And I want to tell you today, if you're not sure whether you're saved, don't wait for another day. Oh, well, I'll do it another day. There's more time. I want to tell you, you're going to be like Agrippa. Almost, almost, almost. You'll get involved in everything else but you'll not get back to when God called you to be saved today. But you have one more chance. One decision could have gone either way. Those of you that are saved and you know it, think about the times that God spared you. Amen, Brother Taylor? If you'd have made a decision the other way, your whole life would be completely different. But I want to tell you, God gave you one more chance. And you have one more chance this morning. Don't put it off. Don't deny that the Lord is talking to you. Well, Brother Yoder, you don't know how hard it would be for me. People in this church, they think I'm saved. Well, first of all, you're misinformed. If you think that the people of this church would be upset with you because you got saved, you're wrong. Amen. And second of all, uh, any embarrassment is worth it when you're talking about eternity. Don't let yourself go to hell because of what somebody else might think. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples, and one of them was never saved. We, we, we would be silly to think that every person in here this morning is saved. You say, who is it, Brother Yoder? I have no idea. But then also, from the parable of the uh, uh, man that's sowing the seed there, we find out that only 25% of them amounted to anything. So I want to tell you, you have one more chance of salvation but you're, if you're already saved, in the area of living the Christian life, you have one more chance. You have one more chance to read your Bible. Hey, did you read your Bible this week? Did you crack those uh, covers at all and take a look and see at what God has for you? He gives you fresh bread every day. Hey, listen, I don't want that, that bread that those worms have been munching on. He told the children of Israel, go collect that manna every day. Get it first thing in the morning, and it'll last you all day long. But the next morning, you go and you get some more. 
Why? Because if you took more in just to try to be a hog and, and be lazy and not get it the next day, it'll be full of worms. We got too many Christians trying to live on last year's blessings. Hey, read your Bible. What, what phrase are you getting in your Bible that sustains you throughout the day when you run into people that could care less about the Word of God? You have one more chance in Bible reading. You have one more chance in praying. Brother Cato, this is a tremendous problem in churches. Boy, they sure know how to talk about praying, but they don't pray. The need for prayer in our churches is astronomical. How many prayed for them while they were on the missions trip? How many pray for us while we're on deputation? How many pray for the pastor while he's on vacation? How many pray for the bus route? How many pray for those people that, that you're sitting beside? Why? Because they're living in the same world that you're living in. They have problems just like you. Many of them have huge health problems. They have to have prayer, and you have that ability to pray for them, but you have not done it. But I want to tell you, you have one more chance. Read your Bible, pray, go to church. Now, I'm not going to preach to you this morning about coming to church. You're here. <laughs> Thank the Lord for that. But I want you to be here tonight, and the Lord wants you to be here tonight. I was talking with, oh, who was I talking with? Somebody about church attendance. I don't, I don't remember who it was. But it had to do with, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says, as you see the day approaching, as you see you're getting closer and closer to the Lord's return, you're supposed to come to church more and more often. All right, if, if Paul wrote that back around uh, the turn of, you know, when it went from B.C. to <laughs> A.D., about 2,000 years ago, okay, how much more have we increased our church attendance since then? They met the first day of the week. Maybe we've increased one service per thousand years. I don't think that's what the Holy Spirit had in mind when he put it in the Bible. But my point is, we can't hardly get you to show up for more than one service. You're, you, you, it's, it's not that I'm upset with you, it's just I don't think you understand what God is trying to do in your life. And you'll never be what God wants you to be when you're starving spiritually. You don't come to church, you don't read your Bible, you don't pray for others. How, how do you expect God to work in you? You don't go soul winning like you should. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But, you, you see, the reason why there's excitement in a family is because you have new births, and people are growing. Man, my, I tell you, my wife and I, we can hardly wait for grandchildren. Because <laughs> we're excited about that already, and we don't even have them. I look at the Villatoro family. Man, they got, they got grandkids and kids and everybody. Man, what, the, I can guarantee you their house is exciting. And we wonder why our church is boring. Now, I don't think our church is boring. But I'll tell you, if we had more new life in here, it'd make a difference. And the, and the Great Commission is not just going into all the world and preaching the gospel. We're, we're supposed to teach those converts as well. Now, what, what's the assumption? The assumption is that you know something to teach them. We have a responsibility. And I think we've been shirking our responsibility in teaching others. You see, the places and the things that, got you, that God brought you through, just like he brought Paul through, was for others. God told him, I'm going to get you all the way to the king. And he did. But God has a plan for you. And you don't know what it is. Why? Because you're to walk by faith. 
for the problems and the people that you've met along the way, God has brought into your life. Why? So that you can use that for other people and teach other people. Sometimes you ought to just get with some of the older people of this church. Bob Wallace and Don Taylor and Danny and, and some of these other guys that are a little bit older and have some experience. And they'll tell you how God works in your life. And, and when you're going through things, you can't imagine, why would God let this happen to me? Why did this happen? And then years later, he reveals it to you. Teaching others. Number one, we have one more chance in salvation. Number two, we have one more chance in living the Christian life. But number three, we have one more chance in the area of separation. You see, the trumpet could sound tonight, and that'd be it. You have one more chance. Don't blow it. Listen to me, right now I'm not talking about separation from the world only. I'm also talking about uh, from uh, literal separation from, uh, from sin itself. Now, I'm not, any, and I'm not any big fighter or anything like that. I know you're all afraid of me, but I'm not any kind of a big fighter or nothing like that. I like to wrestle, and I used to lift weights and all that. But I do have a good friend. He didn't make it here this morning. Some of you know him, Ed. Uh, he's he's a, a black belt in kung fu. And he knows a lot of that stuff. And um, every single discipline of self-defense, uh, judo, jiu-jitsu, kung fu, aikido, karate, taekwondo, shotokan, all those things, they tell you your first line of defense is run. <laughs> somebody's holding a gun in your hand or if a gang's around, you don't think in your mind, I wonder if I can take them. <laughs> Get out of there. But yet we're so silly when it comes to the spiritual life and we have these things around us and we think, oh, I can take it. No, you can't take it. That's why you're constantly messing up because you will not separate yourself from the sin itself. We got people living in this church and, and they're messing around with sin they've been playing with, they've been playing with, they've been playing with for years. We got known Christians, good people, living in fornication. We have people looking at things they should not look at. We have people smoking. Every worldling out there knows that Christians are not supposed to smoke. And if you smoke, I'm not hurting you this morning, I'm helping you. Drinking. I remember, um, how many of you know or did know Tom Hamby when he was alive? Okay, many of you did. We went out soul winning one time, and he sat at this table, and all these people were playing cards. And, you know, Tom Hamby, he had a, uh, a country way about himself. And, you know, I can't pretend to be that way because I'm not that way. But if you knew Tom, uh, he was, he was bare, very countrified, okay? And so he went into this room, and all these guys were playing cards, and and he sat down and he said, hey, deal me out a hand. And they looked at him. And he said, why do you look that way? The reason you look that way is because you know Christians are not supposed to be doing these things. The reason that we get enslaved to sin is because we're doing things we know we shouldn't do. We know we should run away from the booze. We know we should get away from people that constantly cuss. We know that we should not be messing around with rock music. Playing with, when I was in the 70s, man, they preached against rock music every week. You don't hardly hear about it anymore. And now when you go into the stores, the music they were preaching against, that's what just comes across on a normal basis at the store. And it's still wrong. You wonder why the Bible isn't on your mind all day. 
because you put yourself in a position to where you're not actually physically separated from the sin itself. And there'll be people today after this service, after this crazy preacher, and they'll go out in the parking lot and they'll turn on the radio. And in 15 minutes, everything that the Holy Spirit pricked your heart about will be gone. Because you didn't separate yourself. Let me ask you, do you want a life of poverty? Do you, lo- do you want a life of prison? Do you want guilt and disease? Do you want to be an addict? Do you, do you want to be the next person that must go to RU? My good friend back there, Jimmy, how you doing? Glad you're here this morning. Would you like to go to the doctor a couple years from now when you're just age 16 and hear, I've got a disease, I'll be stuck with it the rest of my life? Do you want those kinds of things? No, you don't. Who would want that? But unless you separate from the sin, the wages of sin is death, and that has not changed. But I want to tell you, you have one more chance to run. Get away from it. The Bible tells us to lay the sin down that that so easily besets us. When? While we're running. Remember? While we're running. Number four, you have one more chance to fellowship with God. You see, he's waiting. I went to one church, (laughs) and my wife will get a chuckle out of this, down on the river, Right, right, just right inside uh, the West Virginia border, right next to the river. We were going down along uh, 77 and traveling straight down, and we had crossed over into West Virginia for a long time. And so I thought, well, we can't be close to the Ohio River. But there's a little section that just comes out, just kind of like the... the uh, the nation of Italy, how it comes out like a little boot. Well, there's a little part of Ohio that does that too. And so right there is right where that church is where we visited. So literally, right across the street was the Ohio River. And we were down into West Virginia. Don, you know what I'm talking about down there? Okay. And this, this pastor got up, and he was, he was preaching about soul winning. And he said, here's one of the things I do. I knock on people's doors. And he said, Uh, One of your friends sent me here. And they wanted me to tell you that they love you. But they haven't heard from you for a long time. And the person says, oh yeah, who is it? It's Jesus. He said he has never had anybody get mad at him or slam the door when he says that. He said most of the time they break down and cry. The number one thing in your Christian life is your fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's why you're here. You say, Brother Paul Abel, man, I'm going through some tough things. My health hasn't been what it used to be. But you see, he's still got you here because he wants you to fellowship with him. I don't understand all those things, but somehow... When we go through that and we do what we're supposed to, God gets the glory. And that's what it's all about. Are you going to live your Christian life without fresh oil? I know you love the Lord of your salvation, but is He your friend? Do you have another chance to be thankful? Is your Christian life simply a life of missed opportunities? I hope not. We need to get busy about the Father's business. Let's go to Romans chapter 13. Please turn to Romans chapter 13 and let's look here beginning with verse 11. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. He's not talking to you that just came back from the missions trip. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness 
and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, and that is a command. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that by fellowshipping with God. Certainly, if you watch the news at all or see anything like that, you must be aware of how close the Lord's return is. But Paul has to tell him here, awake! We still have one more chance to get something done. Our physical redemption draweth nigh. Hey, I'm saved. Every bit of me saved, but I'm still waiting for the redemption of my body. I'm still waiting when I get a new body that's like that of my Savior. That hasn't happened yet. So I have, I have something to look forward in my Christian life, no matter how bad it goes for me here in the world. Hey, one day I'm going to wake up with no pain. One day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to realize I don't have glasses on anymore and I can see perfect. God will open these eyes of flesh and I'll be able to see all the things that are happening in the spiritual realm. Things that I didn't understand before. But we have got to put off the darkness and put on the light. One more chance to fellowship with God. Did you spend some time with the Lord this week? Actually talking to Him and thanking Him and praising Him for His goodness. Number five, we're almost done. You have one more chance to prove your love. You see, Jesus Christ proved His love on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. He gave it all for you so that you could be saved and go to heaven. But have you proven your love for Him? No, you don't have to prove your love in order to go to heaven. He gave you salvation as a free gift. But I want to tell you, man, I am thankful I'm saved. It's been over 47 years since I wondered whether or not I've been on my way to hell or not. Thank God for that. My mind is clear. I know for sure I'm going to heaven. If the worst thing happens to me, Xavier, I am on my way to heaven. And I'd like to prove my love to my Savior. I'm going to prove it with my time. I'm going to prove it with my talents. I'm going to prove it with my money. I'm going to prove it with whatever amount of intelligence that I have. <laughs> What's love? Love is a commitment. I'm demonstrating these things by my commitment to his work. Prove your love. You have one more chance to prove your love to God. You have one more chance to prove your wife that your wife that you still love her. Ah, oh, brother Yoder, why'd you have to go there? You heard her, she just gave me the approval. <laughs> you have one more chance to prove to your husband that you love him. You know, I, 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 I was uh, probably not the best dad I wanted to be. But I guarantee you, if you called up my girls and said, do you know for sure that your dad loved you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, God! Do you know that your son or daughter loves you? I hope he would respond. Absolutely. How about your wife? Does your wife know for sure that you love her? Wife? Does your husband know for sure that you love him? Children and family, do you love each other? I mean, really. Oh, brother, you don't know the problems that go on in our home. Amen. Thank the Lord, I don't know. <laughs> but you can't say that you love God 
if you don't even love the people in your family. And Christian brothers and sisters, we're all part of that. Hey, you have one more chance to prove your love. When it comes to Christ's service and, his, and, and demonstration for your love, don't have the mindset, there's always tomorrow. When I worked for a, a landscaping uh, uh, place up in Canton, Ohio, and it was a pretty, pretty big outfit. I mean, they had tons of trucks and bunches of crews, and we'd go out and we'd, well, we'd mulch and cut grass and rake leaves and do all this kind of stuff. But the way that it worked is the younger guys on the crew, and I was one of the younger guys at the time, we did the hard manual labor. And the older guys on the crew, or the bosses, they'd run the weed eater a little bit. They'd talk with the people they had the contract with. You know, they'd go get a drink of water. You know, they'd do those kinds of things. And that's okay, because that was their job. That's, what, that's the position that they had, okay? <clears throat> and I, I asked the boss one time that was in charge of our crew, and I'd say, you know, you're running the weed eater. Why, why did you leave some grass over there next to those trees and, and some grass over there next to that stop sign and some grass and so forth? And you know what his response was? He said, well, we need to save some for next time. <laughs> See, he was trying to make himself job security. But I want to tell you, it doesn't work that way in a Christian life. When you have opportunities for service, the time for service is now. If you have opportunities for soul winning, the time for soul winning is now. When you have an opportunity to be a blessing to the pastor, the time for that is now. When you have a chance to be a, a blessing to someone in this church, the time for that is now. I, I, I'm, I, I love what this church does for missions. And uh, Lord willing, we'll get to be a part of that this year. And, 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 and I love that. But if you do something wonderful for the missionaries, but you won't do something wonderful for the guy on the other side of the aisle for you, you're messed up. You know, how, how many of you men right now, if one of the ladies of this church uh, cooked a delicious pie and gave it to your wife, how many of you men would be for that? Okay, everybody's hand in here except for one or two. Thought, thought, I, was, thought I was making a joke. Uh, uh, would be for that. Why do we always wait till somebody is sick and can't do anything before we want to be a blessing to them? I love my children. I'd, I'd help them any way that I could. And sometimes I do extra things for them, not because they need it, just because I love them. We should do that with one another. And we have an opportunity to prove our love. We should not have this save some for next time for our brothers and sisters in Christ or for the work of this church. You have one more chance at service. It is, I'll just mention this and then I'll get off this point. Is your service for the Lord, is, is it always secondary in your life? Well, if I don't have anything going on, I'll help you out there. Appreciate that. Thanks for the help. But why, why is it always number two or on down the list? You have one more chance at service. Some of you need to be in the choir, and you're not in the choir. I don't know whether you want an extra written invitation from Bob or what, but uh, you need to be singing and using your voice for the Lord. You have a chance to do it. My wife and I, we, we had a, it is our privilege to be on deputation and we get to see a lot of churches and so forth. And we went into this one church and I'm telling you, every, Brother Cato, I am not stretching this, okay? We went into this church and everybody in that church was singing at the top of their lungs. Now, if I was going to complain about anything, I'd complain about the amount. We sang about nine songs every single verse. And my lungs were worn out, and so was my throat. <clears throat> but I'll tell you, during the week, all week long, I was singing those songs in my head. And, and, and teenagers, young people, 
actually singing, reading what was in the hymnal to the top of their voice to the Lord. It was incredible. You could be that way. Let's go back to Acts. And we'll finish right there. I'm not going to run you late this morning. You've been awful kind to me listening. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Paul's telling this now to give an, uh, uh, his testimony of what happened to him when he got saved. And God told him that he was to go to the Gentiles. And then in verse 18 it says, To open their eyes and to turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You see, Paul, even when he was under pressure and standing before King Agrippa, he knew he had an opportunity to win souls. And literally, like Agrippa, when you talk to them, it may be their last chance. We're talking about a last opportunity for you for service, but it may be their last chance literally for heaven or hell. The older I get, the more I'm encouraged because the, the greater number of people that are already uh, dead and have gone to heaven and are waiting for me that I have won to the Lord. I remember one of the, one of the greatest times in our Christian life was there was, there was an 86-year-old woman, no, not 86, uh, 68-year-old woman, uh, Spanish lady, uh, Senora Ventura, that got saved and she said, I wanted to be baptized. I want to tell you, for Spanish people, that's a big thing, getting them baptized. Because they know when they get baptized that there's going to be a separation between them and their family. And so this older lady, she, she said, I want to be baptized. And when we baptized her, man, there was a cheer that went up and everything. But I want to tell you, that was a long time ago. And let, her health wasn't that great back then. So I have all kinds of people like Senora Ventura uh, waiting for me in heaven. I remember there was a trailer park right over here off of Frank Road. There was double wide trailers in there, beautiful places. I never saw trailers like that before in my life. They were nicer than my house. And, and we went in there and there were some old people in there. And I talked to this older couple and the wife gave a good testimony of salvation. And, and she said, but my husband isn't saved. And and he wasn't, and he was honest. He said, no, I've heard about this for years, but I'm not saved. And so uh, I went through the, the scriptures with him, and he asked the Lord Jesus to come into his heart and save him. That was in the springtime. Uh, I was working on the church property, and uh, they, the office called me and said, hey, we want you to come over here to the office. And that lady was in there in the summertime. Said, I want you to know my husband passed away, but I thought you'd want to know that because of your obedience to God, he's in heaven. You see, verse 26 is our purpose, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. You have one more chance to do that. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, I thank you for giving us this example through uh, Agrippa. Lord, I'm sorry uh, that he never received you as personal Savior, and if he did, I'm sure he's rejoicing in heaven. But Lord, we don't want to be like that example. First of all, in salvation. Lord, I don't want anybody to go to hell, but I can't be saved for them. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, how many would say, Brother Yoder, I know 100% for sure that I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. If that's you as a testimony, would you raise your hand? Amen. Amen. Hands all over the room. You can put your hands down. 
how many would be honest and say, uh, Brother Yoder, I'm not 100% sure. I'd like to be sure, but I'm not 100% sure. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you raise your hand? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Put your hands down. If you're not sure, if you're saved, and you'd like to be, would you put your hand up so I could pray for you? Heavenly Father, you know the hands and you know the hearts. But Lord, I, I preached a lot more this morning than on just salvation. So I pray that once again the people would be honest. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed, how many would say, Brother Yoder, you preached about one more chance, one more chance. And there was something in my life that the Holy Spirit talked to me about, maybe one of the points that you mentioned or something else. And the Holy Spirit said, I'm giving you one more chance. Would you make a change in your life for me? If that's you, would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Amen. 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 Holy Spirit, thank you so much for doing the work. And now, Heavenly Father, you see the hands, but you also see the hearts. I pray, Lord, as we give the invitation, that they would come forward, make a commitment for you, and because of their love, they would follow through with their commitment. Thank you once again for allowing us to preach from the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand in the building and she plays for us, with our heads still bowed and our eyes closed, come forward, thank God for one more chance. Or if he spoke to you about getting something taken care of, don't delay. Almost. Almost. Can you hear Agrippa this morning? Almost. Almost. Don't let that be you. How's your Christian life? Brother Yoder, I was almost a good Christian. Come forward. Ask the Lord for his help. I was almost a good father. I was almost a good mommy. Get it right. Don't wait on anybody else. The Lord's talking to you. How about your service for the Lord? How busy have you been for him working in this church for your Lord Jesus Christ the last three months? Or have you been getting sidetracked with every little thing? The Lord brought you here in this service this morning for a reason. And it wasn't for me to yell at you. It was for the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Have you talked with Him this week? Have you fellowship with your Savior? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you for Brother Dave and the, just the truth that he brought this morning, almost. I pray that uh, we would not be the one that says almost, but we would take that one more chance and take advantage of that one more chance that you give us for service. Uh, one more chance.
to do what you would have us to do. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for giving us such a, a, a great word this morning. And I pray that as we go uh, and leave this place, that uh, you would be honored through the remainder of this day. Lord, I pray that we would not soon forget your precious word. pray that we would not uh, be distracted by the cares of this world. We would continue to remember uh, your word. We thank and we praise you for being so good. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Brother Yoder, if you and Mrs. Yoder would stand in the back and greet folks as they leave, I'd appreciate that. Let's uh, sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God as we are dismissed this morning. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joined heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.